All right, if you would mind turning with me in your Bibles to the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 9, this will be our third message from this chapter, and because there's so much in it, I trust that it will be a help to us as we consider from verse 31 to the end of the chapter of Acts chapter 9. So beginning in verse 31, it says, Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. And it came to pass as Peter passed throughout all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt in Lydda. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. And Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. And all that dwelt in Lydda and, Char and Saron uh, saw him and turned to the Lord. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. And for as much as Lydda was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. And when he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber. And all the widows stood by him, weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed, and turning him to the body and said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many <clears throat> believed in the Lord. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon, a tanner. And again, God will bless the reading of his word to us this morning. I'm going to try and tie these three kind of uh, what seem initially maybe as in, in, in connected, not connected ideas of uh, this uh, progress report in verse 31, and then we see Peter uh, with Aeneas, and then we see uh, Dorcas, uh, the final story. So kind of three little things, but uh, as I was meditating on this this morning, I, I felt like the Lord showed me a connecting thread between these three things. And that connecting thread is simply this, progress reports. Now, I don't know if you remember, but back in school, kind of the end of every semester, you got a report to send home. Do you ever remember those things? Now, they probably don't do it anymore because they might you know, destroy Johnny's self-esteem if he got a bad report. <laughs> but, but back in my day, we used to get them. And uh, I can remember dreading it because cause my dad would have to see it. And I know what I was going to say before I even opened it. I can tell you some of the phrases. Could do better. <laughs> That was usually one of them, or <laughs> needs to improve, or needs to apply himself, you know, and almost every time, I mean, I don't know if that's the only three phrases they knew, <laughs> it's, the, it's the only three phrases that ended up on my report cards, <laughs> but in this passage, we have report cards, we have a report card of how the churches were doing. And throughout the Acts of the Apostles, we get these seven report cards of how the church is doing. And it's marvelous as we read them. And I'm going to kind of read through them all together so we can see that the, the church is really making progress. It's growing. It's vibrant. It's alive. It's really a good progress report. And then we haven't thought about Peter for a while because we've been focusing on Paul. And so we might ask, well, how's Peter doing? We've kind of lost sight of him for a while. And so we get a progress. Of, well, Peter's doing pretty well. This is what Peter's up to. Uh, he's still healing people that 
were lame. And uh, he's, he's really got a lot of faith and he's really doing well. And then we get what's called the final report of Dorcas. See, Dorcas died. And there are a lot of people that are telling us about Dorcas and what her life <coughs> meant. It's kind of that final report. What you say at somebody's funeral about them. And it's a good report, but of course it's interrupted because Peter spoils it all and raises it from the dead. So she's going to have a few more report cards. But, but her <laughs> final report was really good, at least at this point. And so uh, we're going to consider progress reports. So let's, let's begin with this idea of the churches being assessed as to their progress in the book of Acts. So I want you to go back with me to Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. Acts 2 verse 47. And we're just going to see that these periodic reports are very encouraging. And so 247 says, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Well, wouldn't you love to be a part of a church like that, where people are getting saved daily, like not just once a year or once every five years, daily people are getting saved. Now, that sounds like revival to me. And during times of revival, that's kind of happens. People get saved daily, even hourly. It's amazing. And we should be praying for that. Oh, Lord, I'd love to see that. Wouldn't you love to see people getting saved daily? Be the church being added to it. Not people, you know, coming because they're studying here, like our brother that's come, going to be spending a few months with us. And we're glad to have you, brother. Don't misunderstand. But seeing people saved and added to the church. That would be amazing. Well, that's how it's going. Chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, verse 7. Acts 6, verse 7. It says, the word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So now it's not just adding, it's multiplication, right? It's multiplying, and even a great number of the priests, these religious zealots are getting converted. Wow, that's a pretty good report, isn't it? Oh, how we'd love to see something like that. <laughs> Chapter 12 and verse 24. Chapter 12, verse 24, but the word of God grew and multiplied. It's not saying that there are 67 books of the Bible, or six, no, but it's, it's growing. It's growing, and, and people are paying attention to the word of God, and they're being changed by the word of God, and it's having a marvelous effect on lives. Chapter 16, Acts chapter 16 and verse 5, and so were the churches established in the faith, and increased in number daily. Chapter 19, Acts chapter 19, and verse 20. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. And then the final one is in Acts chapter 28. Acts 28, verses 30 and 31. It says, And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house, and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching all things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. And so what we see really all the way through Acts is that the work is growing. The word of God, uh, in the words of another scripture, is having free course and being glorified it's it's having an impact and sadly if we're really honest and it'd be good sometimes to evaluate our progress right this is the churches plural but even if we did that and looked at the churches in north america are we seeing progress or have we witnessed years of continual slow steady decline and we, we love new testament christianity but it seems to me that the new testament church was a growing church and the word of god was multiplying was affecting lives changing lives and how we need to get earnest and say lord change it we want to change our progress report to well we're holding our own 
or maybe we're just lying, you know? <laughs> no, wouldn't it be good to have a better report? Yeah, we need a better report. And Lord, use us, uh, make us available to be instruments that you can use so that the church can be added to and can be multiplied and can grow. We don't want to be part of something stagnant or even declining. We want to see you change it. And so I think we need to pray earnestly about this and, and honestly evaluate. It'd be good for us to evaluate how are we, now we might say we're making progress in, in some areas, and I know we are, and I'm thankful for every area where as an assembly we're making progress. Praise God for that. But, but we need more. We really need more. And we particularly need new life. Lord, use it somehow to reach souls with the gospel. And let's see it added to. That would be a wonderful thing. New life just has such an impact on the church. It really does. The excitement, the thrill of it all, just uh, kind of is contagious. Uh, things that they hear from scripture and they just, wow. And, and suddenly you look at it and you say, no, I've known that for a long time. But it really is wow, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And we need that wow factor. <clears throat> so we do need to pray about our progress as churches. But then we said, what about Peter? How is Peter doing? Well, Peter's doing well. And uh, we haven't heard from him for a while. We've been concentrating on Paul. Uh, but we're going back to look at Peter again and just to see how he's getting on. And it tells us that he's kind of doing some itinerant work. It says it came to pass, verse 32, Peter passed through all, all, all quarters. And so he's kind of visiting these areas where the gospel has spread. Remember, it started in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Uh, it's moving out. So he's going around and he's visiting these places and ministering in these places. And uh, he came down also to the saints which dwelt in Lydda. Now, it's the modern day in Israel, Lod. And uh, it's kind of just a little bit southwest of Tel Aviv. And uh, it's in the Valley of Sharon. And that's where he's visiting and there's believers there. And so he goes down to, to see the saints which dwelt at Lydda. And there, it tells us, he found this certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. And so uh, this word palsy uh, in the King James, it comes from uh, a Latin word, which we get our English word paralysis. So the guy's paralyzed. He, he can't move. And so and he's been like that for eight years. Something has happened. Maybe a stroke. I don't know, but in a position where for eight years he has been unable to move and he's kept his bed because there's nowhere else he can go. That's been his condition. And of course, we're reminded that earlier on, there was a man that Peter and John, remember, met at the temple. And he'd been 40 years in that condition. And of course, uh, they, they, he was leaping and, and, and praising God and all the rest of it. Uh, walking, leaping, praising God. But here, this man's eight years. And I suppose it tells us, uh, you know, the Lord is able to deliver somebody, whether they've been 40 years in a crippled state or eight years. And we're thinking about the gospel, particularly making people whole. Because I, I love the language here. Peter said to Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. But he just loved that language. I, I love that. There was what it's saying is that if a person doesn't know Christ and doesn't have Christ in their life and it, it is not one of his, they're not really whole. There's something missing. There's a big thing missing in their life. And the only way that missing thing will ever be filled is with Christ. I was reading a, a, a wonderful scripture about uh, his saving health among the nations. And, and it really is. This world is sick. It's, it's absolutely spiritually crippled. And there's no political solution going to fix it. Only Christ can fix it. Only the gospel can change a man. Only the gospel can make someone whole again. And so we got to preach this message that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And to make them whole. To take them in their brokenness. And we're all broken people. Every one of us, we're broken people, and only he can put the pieces, only he can put Humpty Dumpty back together again. 
all the king's horses and all the king's men, they can't do it. But Jesus Christ can do it. And oh, how we need to lift him up. The one who died on Calvary's cross to make man whole. The savior, the only savior. And so Peter sees this man in his condition. He's kept his bed eight years. He's sick of the palsy. He's paralyzed. He can't do anything to save himself. And Peter said to Aeneas, Jesus Christ, make a thing whole. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Jesus is the answer. We used to sing this chorus. I remember one guy, he was a saved druggie, and he used to go around with his guitar, and, he, he, and there was a bunch of us, we'd go witnessing, and he would say, Jesus is the answer. He'd sing this. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him, there's no other. Jesus is the way. And of course, he was a, a man who was a, being a broken man. The Lord had put him together again, and he could sing that with passion. Yet Jesus is the answer. Oh, he's the answer. If you've never come to Christ, and I'm not assuming because you're here that you're really his. You could be as lost as lost can be, sat in those pews. If you've never come to him, you'll never be whole. You'll never be complete. We want you to be whole. We, we don't want you to live life as a spiritual cripple. Hindered from really fulfilling all that God intended for your life. We don't want that. We want you to come to the one that can make you whole, make you complete. And so if you've never done that. Please see that God loves you. Christ died for you on Calvary's cross. Receive him as your savior, even this morning. And your life will be whole. And you can try and fill it with all kinds of things, but he'll never, you'll never find fulfillment and satisfaction outside of the person of Christ, ever. And people are trying, desperately trying, but they're not succeeding because only Jesus can make a person whole. Amen. And so it says that um, all they, verse 35, that dwell at Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. This miracle had a startling effect. Notice it says all that dwell in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Wow. Can you imagine? The whole community was affected by this miracle. All in Lydda and Sharon. Wow, what, what a tremendous, wouldn't you love to see the whole community affected <laughs> by the gospel of Jesus Christ, making someone whole? That would be something, wouldn't it? And communities have been affected. Great revival in the Isle of Lewis, 1949. Every pub on the island shut, never opened to this day. The whole community was affected by the gospel. It said the presence of God was everywhere. You couldn't escape. Oh, wouldn't you love to see that? Well, this is what's happening in Lydda. It's amazing. Anyway, we move on. I want to look at the, this final report. And this is a marvelous passage, really, from verse 36. It says, there was a Joppa, a certain disciple. Yeah, she's whole. She's a true disciple. She's called Tabitha. Kind of interesting name, uh, Tabitha, uh, also Dorcas. They both mean the same thing. It means gazelle, kind of like a, you know what a gazelle is, but one of those beautiful little animals and certainly graceful creature. Yeah, of course, it's, she's very fitting. It, it seems to me that Dorcas is a very gracious person, and uh, you see this in her life. And so here's this Tabitha, by interpretation, it's called Dorcas. It tells us just a little description of this woman. It says, this woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. Charitable deeds, good works. Now, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Good works. It, it's something about good works that really impresses people. Uh, several years ago, there were two women that died. And these two women were, were poles apart in every way. One was wealthy and beautiful and young. And she died. And the world mourned her death. The other lady was old and incredibly wrinkled and very poor. And she died. And the world mourned her death. Can you guess what I'm thinking about? What was Lady Diana 
Spencer, the Princes of Wales. <clears throat> remember Lady Di? <clears throat> You're not that old, you can remember that, right? And then, and then <clears throat> the other one was Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Both ladies, and, and I'm saying so different in every respect, and yet the response from the world was identical. They lamented the death of the, now why was it? Because the one thing these two women had in common was they were very actively involved in good works. One was helping lepers and ministering to the poor. The other one, landmines was Lady Di's thing, right? She wanted to eradicate the world of landmines and she was involved in this. It was a passionate thing. And then AIDS as well. And so, so it was their work in what we call charitable deeds and good works that left an impression. And it does leave an impression on the world. It does. Good works. And my father uh, would say that uh, although he had very little time for called Protestantism as a devout Roman Catholic, but the one group he had time a day for was the Salvation Army. Because they're doing good works. And there's something about good that works. It does. It, it leaves a deep impression on people. Now, I need to say this, just in case we're, uh, we get any confusion here. I, I firmly believe with all my heart that salvation is not based on good works. Amen. <clears throat> it's faith alone in Christ alone plus nothing. Okay? So I, I believe, I'm in a sense, I'm not reformed. But I do believe in the five solas of the Reformation. You know those five solas, right? Uh, they're great, really. Sola fide, or sola fide, which is faith alone. Sola Christus, faith in Christ alone, right? Sola Scriptura, like our faith is guided by Scripture and Scripture alone. We don't need tradition. We don't need uh, you know, the church fathers and all this other stuff. We might glean stuff from them, but we don't need them. Scripture is sufficient to guide us in every area of life. Sola Scriptura, sola gracious, uh, gracious, grace alone, right? We're saved by grace. It's God's grace that saves us. And sola Deo Gloria, for the glory of God alone. Now, that'll preach. I, I like, I, I can preach heartily all five of those solas with passion. I believe in all of them. I really do. But there's a tendency in the human heart to have this, what I call, pendulum swing mentality. And so prior to Martin Luther and the Reformation, the Catholic Church basically taught that you're saved by good works. I mean, that was the essential message, really. If, you, if, you, if you're a good person. And it still is to this day. They, they believe in faith in Christ plus good works equals justification. And the difficulty with that formula of faith in Christ plus good works equals justification is this. How many good works do you have to do in order to know that you're really justified? And nobody can give you an answer. Uh, so Pope John Paul dies clinging onto his Mary medal. He's the Pope hoping he's done enough. I'm glad that when I die, I don't have to hope that I've done enough. Mm. Jesus has done enough. Amen. And he finished the work. And I'm standing in the good of a finished work, right? So it's faith alone in Christ alone. So, so on, on the one hand, there's this reaction against this Catholic dogma of good works as a means of salvation. And so then comes a reformation. And it's almost like good works is a dirty word. Right? And, and so Luther can't stand the gospel or, or the, the epistle of James. He calls it a right, strawy epistle. Don't even think it should be in the canon. Right? Why? Because, because it talks about faith without works is dead. And, and you see, his pendulum is over here. He's reacting to the Catholic thing is over here. And truth is never in a ditch. All in the middle. So what do we say about this? Well, what we say is, 
Here, here's the biblical answer. Turn with me, please, to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Now, we love Ephesians chapter 2. This is our, this is our territory. We're comfortable here. And so we say, for by grace are you saved. We say, that's right. That's sola gratia, right? By grace are you saved. We're saved by grace. We don't deserve it. We deserve hell. We don't deserve anything. By grace are you saved. And how are we saved? Through faith. We believe a message concerning Christ and him crucified. And so he says, by grace you're saved through faith. And that not of yourself. It's the gift of God. And we talk about salvation being a gift. And a gift is something you don't earn because then it's wages. It's something you simply receive, right? It's the gift of God. And then it says, not of works. We say, amen. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. And I'm glad. I love that verse. Because can you imagine if we could get to heaven based on our good works? Mm. Imagine being interviewed at the pearly gates. Well, what are you doing here? Well, I was such a nice man. I was so kind to my neighbors, and I saw an old lady walking across the road. I'd grab her arm, and I'd help her across it. And it'd be all about you, right? Wouldn't it? It'd just be you and what you've done and what you know and all. And we'd be, you wouldn't want to be in a place like that, where all the people are talking about themselves all the time, about how good they are. You'd say, let me out of here. I don't want to be part of this place. Well, they'll be boasting in heaven, folks. But the boasting will be this, in Jesus Christ and him. Why am I here? I'm here because a lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. Amen. And I believed on him as my personal savior. My only boast is in Jesus Christ. Nothing else can boast of. But then it, it doesn't stop there, you see. We tend to stop there. But the scripture doesn't stop there. It goes on to verse 10. What it says is that those who are saved through faith, that not of yourself, the gift of God, not of those who say man should boast, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So good works is not the root of salvation, it's the fruit of salvation. I'm saved for a purpose. God has a plan for my life now. God has a purpose for me. And that purpose includes doing good works. It does, and Dorcas got it, right? She's saved by faith. She knows that. But she's, she's doing alms deeds and charitable deeds and all this kind of stuff and good works. And, and she got it. She understood it. Uh, look again at Titus, please. Just want to see this. It's really This is really important that we grasp this. Epistle to Titus, chapter 3, verses 4. It says, but after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. I just love the language of Scripture. After that, the kindness and love of God our Savior. What a kind and loving God and Savior we have. Toward men appear, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Then it says in verse 8, this is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. Those that have believed in God might be careful to maintain. These, these things are good and profitable to men. And so we see that good works is really the fruit of a life that is trusted in the finished work of Christ. As we have opportunity, Scripture says, let us do good to all men, especially to those of the household of faith. Galatians 6 10. So here's Dorcas. And she gets it. She really does. Her life after salvation, because she's a certain disciple. She's believed in the Lord. She's a, a born-again person. And her life was characterized by being full of good works in arms and deeds, which she did and so she's known for that and of course uh, like all of us subject to death 
But we might say this about daughters, is that when she died, she left a big hole behind her. A lot of people had benefited from Dorcas' life. A lot of widows had had clothing made for them by her, destitute widows, and she'd help them. And, and so, uh, in the words of Robert Murray McShane, that godly Scottish preacher, he said this <coughs> concerning the life of God. He says, we all should live so as to be missed. Now, not, uh, you know, some people, you, 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 like when they're gone, it's almost like a sense of relief, you know? <laughs> you know? That, that should not be the idea. <laughs> We should be, we should live in such a way that we leave a gaping hole behind us. Am I living that kind of life? What would they say at my funeral? You see, at Dorcas, they could produce the evidence. And they did. If, if you look a little bit further there, uh, it, it says um, that uh, verse 39, Peter arose, Peter arose, went with them, and when he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. <laughs> so, I mean, her, her works followed her, didn't they? I mean, <laughs> it, it's, it's so evident what she's done. So, you know... Some of you may have to preach my funeral one day, or I may have to preach your funeral someday. Make it easy on us, please. <laughs> right? I mean, I've been at funerals, and you know, sometimes it's hard to say something realistically about the person, even though they profess salvation in Christ, it's hard to really say something with integrity and honesty about their testimony. Make it easy for people to preach your funeral sermon because you're living so as to be missed. And that's how she, so what was her final report card? It was pretty good, wasn't it? She had a good testimony amongst the saints. And when she died, it left a big hole. What about in this assembly? I often say it, I'm just going to say it one more time. If everybody in the assembly was like me, what kind of an assembly would there be? See, an assembly never rises above the caliber of the people that fellowship there. Do I make a difference? Am I an encourager? Am I a refreshing brother? Do I refresh the saints? Or am I the kind of brother that, uh, that when I walk in the room, it kind of spoils the environment? What, what kind of people are we? How are we doing? What's our progress report? And what will our final report be? You see, these are important questions. So here's Dorcas, and when she died, it's kind of interesting. They did a very interesting thing. Verse 37 says, It came to pass in those days that she was sick and died. And when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. They're not in a rush to bury her. That's kind of a strange thing. Why are they not in a rush to bury her? Well, I think that word had got to them about what had happened not too far away in Lydder, where this fellow Aeneas had been a cripple for eight years. And Peter, through God's grace and power, had been able to restore him and make him whole. And so maybe deep down in their hearts, there's a little bit of faith here. Well, maybe Peter could come and give us Dorcas back because we sure love to have her back. We'd love to have her back. Isn't that a nice thing to, to be? I, I wish they were back. Kurt's smiling, but you know, when you guys went down to Joplin, we were all wishing you'd come back. And you came back, and we praise God for that. We're, right? We want to be those kind of people. We, we hate it when they're gone. We wish they were back. So they, they wish Dorcas was back. They want her back. And so they put her in this upper room and they, they send Peter. And so it says, for as much as Lydda was nigh to Joppa, the disciples had heard that Peter was there. You see, word had got out that Peter was there. Probably what Peter had been doing had come to their ears. And so it says they sent him two men desiring that he would not delay to come to them. Peter rose and went with them. 
And when he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber. And all the widows stood by him, weeping, showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed. Kind of reminds you of the story when the Lord Jesus, he healed that little girl. Remember, 12 years of age? But in his case, he allowed some of the disciples to be there. He didn't put them all out. And actually, the Lord Jesus didn't pray. He just said, Tabitha, her eyes, and she did. But in this case, our little little maid arise. Talitha Kumi, right? Only one letter different. It's kind of interesting. Tabitha, Talitha. You know, it's kind of an interesting parallel between the two. But um, Peter had to pray because he didn't have the power himself to raise him from the dead. And so he put them all forth. He kneeled down and he prayed, turning him to the body and said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand, lifted her up, and when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And it came to pass, he tarried many days. And so here's Peter, and he's enabled again by God's grace to raise this woman from the dead. What you would say about Dorcas, and we want to think about her just as we wrap up this morning. If anybody knew that her labor was not in vain in the Lord, it was her. Because all those people were there, and they all had the evidence of the good works that she had done, and they'd all been blessed by it, and she had made an impression through her good works and charitable deeds, which he did. And again, John Wesley, I can't quote it exactly, but he said that we're to do all the good we can to all the people we can, in all the ways we can, whatever we can, something like that. It's probably longer than that, but it's a great saying. And so every day we need to say, Lord, make me a blessing. It doesn't sing it, right? Make me a blessing to some heart today. Make me a blessing. Help me to make a difference in somebody's life. Because ultimately there's a day coming and there'll be a progress report or there'll be a final report. This is your life. What's it going to say? Is it, is it going to be like Dorcas who lived so as to be missed? Or is it going to be a great relief? That guy was such a contentious, troublesome brother. We're glad the casket is closed. <laughs> and that ends his chapter. You see, how I live today determines what my final report will be. And it's little daily choices and daily decisions that make up a life, isn't it? In the Christian life, the Lord Jesus said, if you really want to follow me, you have to deny yourself. Take up the cross daily and follow me. It's a sacrificial life. It's an others-centered life. Remember joy, Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. And I would say this, that the most miserable person on planet Earth is a me-centered Christian, a self-centered, self-obsessed Christian is a miserable specimen. But a joyful specimen gets it right. Jesus first. He has to be first. Others second, and yourself last. There's a day coming, and our final report card will come in. Yes, in terms of our eternal destiny, it's by faith alone, in Christ alone, plus nothing. But in terms of our service, what will that final report card say? I hope it will say, well done, good and faithful servant, and not, should have tried harder, <laughs> maybe <laughs> I'll do better. 
could have improved. What's it going to do? That's good. Father, we're so grateful for your word and it challenges us. We pray, Lord, we, we'd be honest. Lord, I know this is a busy day and we've got things to do, but we pray that there might be some pondering in your presence today about the things we've considered. First of all, what are we trusting in? Are we trusting in the finished work of Christ? Are we really made whole, complete? Or is there still that gaping hole, that God-shaped void in our lives that only, only you can fill? What if there's someone who's never done that, Lord, that today would be a great day for them to trust in the Savior of sinners, the Lord Jesus. And then, Father, we think of our church and the churches in general. Lord, we'd love to move from days of decline to days of additions and even multiplications. Lord, we'd love to have a great progress report that we're really impacting people. The word of the Lord is growing and multiply. Lord, what a joy that would be. Lord, can you change it? We know you can. Lord, make us willing to change as well. And then we think of individually, Lord, how are we doing? How are we really doing? Help us to be honest in your presence. Are we making progress spiritually? Are we known for good works? Lord, what are we, how do people view our lives? And then what will they say at that final report? Oh, Lord, we, and ultimately, what will you say at that final report? Help us, Lord, to consider these things. And help us to respond appropriately where necessary. And we'll give thee the glory. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Thank you.